I don't think I've ever said that here, so it <laughs> feels like we sang the theme song, or the combo sang the theme song, so that's uh, of this church, it sounds like, since I kept hearing that ever since I started here last December. So, so I'll join in. God is good. All the time. Uh, the scripture reading is uh, from the Gospel of Mark, which has been read in Thai, so I'll now read it in English. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he, meaning Jesus, said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism which, with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that's the word of the Lord. Well, I know it's not lunch yet, but think, why don't you think of the best meal you've ever had with members of your family or friends? Um, I'm sure you can think of that situation. You're familiar with that. Uh, suppose you've just had the best meal with family and friends that you've ever had for a long time. Uh, your stomach feels full of tasty dishes, uh, whether these dishes are Thai food or something else, you know, that's up to you. And your heart is happy because you've just been laughing so much, you've been having a very nice and pleasant conversation with everybody, uh, and you're highly satisfied, and almost nothing is left on the table uh, where the food used to be. You know, it's, it's really that good. Uh, then there's plans for karaoke afterwards. So you're looking forward to some fun times, you know, singing. Then, as you're sitting down on your sofa out of the corner of your eye, you know, you, you see the kitchen. And a few moments you realize that the kitchen is a mess and something needs to be done. But the idea, though, is, you know, you're in your chair the idea of actually rising up your chair and going to the kitchen seems like a dream. You know, it, it doesn't look real. Uh, so you think, well, you know, the, the children should do it. Or, or you can look at your spouse and say, or significant other and say, well, you know, you can do it. And then your cell phone rings and you say, oh, oh, I need to get the cell phone. And that way you don't have to clear the table, you don't have to go to the kitchen. I mean, it would be rude to do something else while you're talking to someone on the phone, wouldn't it? Um, so that's just a scenario. I don't know if that's happened to you, but things like that can happen in many ways. Um, people can put off projects around the house until a few months later when it looks bad. Then after the house project is done, whether it's fixing a shelf or cleaning the gutters, uh, we expect our spouse or family to thank us and appreciate us for everything we've done. Um, in a way, it's an example of how, you know, at certain points, uh, a lot of us could be slow to serve, but very quick to want the glory. 
Uh, now, of course, that doesn't happen all the time, uh, especially for this church, you know, because I know most of you are not slow to serve. Especially, I think a lot of you have the habit of wanting to fix things immediately uh, or get things done. And I've seen a lot of you in church work really well in cleanup uh, every Sunday and in every special event. So definitely you guys are, are not slow to serve. Um, but deep down inside, you know, if, if we actually have a choice, we would likely prefer that work and problems go away without, you know, without much effort. We would in reality prefer comfort and compliments and honor without having to necessarily do much. And in our passage today in Mark, we see that the disciples are in a way slow to serve and eager for honor. And Jesus' word to the disciples, I mean, we'll see if this is in a way applicable to us. Uh, but first, let's take a look at the passage. Uh, I normally give a context first of what's going on uh, before this passage came uh, in the story. And the events that lead up to our gospel story has Jesus traveling to Jerusalem for the last time. And as you may remember in the past weeks, uh, as I've been preaching, uh, Jesus has been talking about discipleship. That's what we've been mostly been talking about. Uh, we've been talking about what it means to be a disciple, how much it costs us. And last week, it's even about the rewards. You know, what's good about being a disciple of Christ? Uh, today's message speaks of another important aspect of discipleship because in a way it shows us uh, what a disciple does. A disciple, in a way, it's not slow to serve. And the followers of Jesus are ready to serve for the sake of the gospel, no matter if it takes much struggle or discomfort. Uh, so we see in Mark 10 that James and John made this request to be in the right or left hand of Jesus. And to sit at the right and left hand of Jesus on his throne is in a way to seek high honor. Uh, that's seeking power. Uh, they were already thinking as Jesus headed towards Jerusalem that Jesus was ready to take over and establish this earthly kingdom like the Roman Empire, but a much stronger and more holier, pure kingdom. Uh, so in one sense, they do believe in Jesus. Uh, they believe that Jesus will reign, uh, but they fail to listen to Jesus because Jesus told them that he's going to go to the cross, that he will be betrayed to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And then they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. But on the third day, he will rise again. But those disciples, they weren't interested in listening to Jesus talk about suffering and struggling. Instead, they were thinking about their own honor and glory. And sometimes we could be the same way. Uh, now, now, don't get me wrong. It's not bad to desire honor. All parents, I think all parents, would want to hear their children say, um, you're a great dad or you're a great mommy. Um, and God created human beings with this dignity inside us. And no one wants to be called a fool or someone unwise. But should we want the best and highest honor? Should parents tell themselves, I am the best parent in the world? And if you want to be the best in anything anyway, and get honor in anything, you need to put in the effort and make the most of your talents and gifts. For example, if you aspire to be great in music, in medicine, in finance, or in anything else, you need time to grow and exert much effort and do things you are not comfortable in. And in reality, there's no harm in aspiring to be the best as long as it fits the purpose of serving God and serving others. And in the case of the disciples in our story today, to be great in God's kingdom actually comes with a price. The price comes from following the way or the example of Jesus. So Jesus says to James and John, can you 
drink the cup that I'm going to drink. The cup signifies suffering, sometimes even wrath, retribution and punishment in the Old Testament. Remember in Gethsemane, Jesus asked the Father if this cup of suffering could pass him by? So in a way, you can see Jesus' way is suffering. Discipleship by Jesus' way comes through following the way of suffering and hardship. So when the other disciples heard about what James and John were doing, you know, they, they were angry. They also had the same hopes that James and John had, and they were also thinking of their own glory. So what Jesus did was he took time to clarify his way to glory. Um, he says he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, most of you know that a ransom is a purchase price uh, paid to get the release of a captive. You know, a king might pay a ransom to set free a general or a son captured in battle during Jesus' time. So someone might pay a price to set a slave free. But in Jesus' case, Jesus offered not money, but himself to save us from the power and consequences, consequences of sin. Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for us on the cross. And through what he did, God granted godly or godless, unrighteous, and sinful people this certain righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Because of what Jesus did, he released us from sin, the power and the consequences of that, which included guilt, condemnation, physical and eternal death. And we all know the saying, you know, Jesus paid the price with his blood. And by paying the price, God liberates us who put our faith and trust in Jesus from being a slave to sin or to anybody other than God. So instead, God gave us freedom to live this new life. Um, this new life that's not after what is evil or bad, but a life that has Jesus or God as Lord because He purchased us in a way. We are, He owns us. He is our new master. And if we follow the metaphor correctly, as I said, we're now slaves. We're now, in a way, destined to follow Christ's example. You know, so whatever Christ does, that is now who we are made to follow. So if His example is to serve and sacrifice before we experience our glory, that's what Jesus calls us to do. Now, just to clarify, you know, Jesus' work on the cross is unique. It's one time. It's His work. It's not something we can do. He already did that. Uh, but he said that his followers, to his followers, that we should serve just as, or even as, the Son of Man came to serve. So again, while his work on the cross is unique and one time, his life is a pattern or example for us. We are to follow Jesus in serving as he has served us. And I think maybe you guys have heard this term, you know, servant leadership. That's been thrown around in many places when it comes to serving. Is that familiar? No? Okay. Maybe in some circles. Um, it's called servant leadership because, uh, partly because it is in serving that Jesus calls someone great instead of someone who tries to be Lord or boss over others. Um, so it's kind of different from how you know, the secular world thinks it's not about lording people, it's about serving others, which is the kind of leadership that Jesus displayed for us. So for the rest of its time, I'm just going to have two quick things to say about being a servant of Christ. Uh, first thing that I'm going to say is that the greater the servant, the more humble the servant. It is important when you serve God that your motives are good. Because there are people who seem like good servants, but their motives aren't necessarily the best. Uh, some may just want to be seen as good in the eyes of others. And they show off their service because of pride and desire to get recognized 
and to get glory for what they do and get praise for being the servant of God. Um, some may want to feel the need to be uh, indispensable so they can feel important on the inside by looking like they're glorifying God on the outside. So all I'm saying is, being a servant of God, it's important to have good motives. The second thing I want to say about service, uh, specifically just in application to our church and what we do here in ministry, is that a lot of Christians normally serve in areas where they are blessed and gifted by God. And that's, there's something really good to say about God giving us gifts and talents and us being able to use them to serve and bless others. And that is definitely glorifying to God. That is good. For example, here at church, uh, we may have someone like Betsy who puts her skills and finances to work for the church. Then you have all the musicians in the FTPC combo and our volunteer pianists who are very passionate about worship and music. And it's good that they're able to find a ministry that uses their gifts and talents. Uh, then we have people, you probably know who you are, who are very good in ministries that deal with compassion uh, due to illness or even death. And, and of course, I don't want to discount all the good cooks in this church. Uh, there's too many of you who contribute using your time, effort, talents to prepare a good lunch for our fellowship. And then there's even new things, you know, like a website development committee that's been meeting to help our church launch our new website. And among the members of that committee is uh, Jennifer, who's not even technically or formally a member, although she will be soon. Um, it's good to see her find a place for her to use her God-given gifts and skills uh, for that purpose. So all I'm saying is overall, it is a blessing uh, to serve, especially to serve our Lord using what God himself has provided us. In a way, doing what we're good at gives us a good comfort zone in serving the Lord. And within the time and commitment we make in serving within that, we are able to bless others and further God's kingdom. So in a way, I'm thinking of how, you know, how our, our church serves and and uh, because of course God calls us to serve but there is another kind of service that in a way often gets neglected uh, and that is the service of people doing things that are not comfortable people who are doing things that are beyond their comfort zone and this happens at times in 